Thank you very much. It's a privilege to uh, be here. I hope I don't get hypnotized by the green numbers uh, counting down in, in, in front of me. It's a bit, uh, a bit spooky. Uh, I'll start. And uh, first of all, before I start talking about NORM, I think it's important to remind everybody that everything is radioactive. And not just in North American and European homes, but there's even radon, radon here. We're all exposed to radiation all the time, our whole lives, and we always have been. We've evolved in the presence of natural radioactivity. We've talked about cosmic rays. We talked about exposure to, to uh, rays from the, from the sun for, for uh, pilots and stewardess and, and astronauts. It's part of our life. Terrestrial sources include the thorium and potassium and uranium series radionuclides. Most of the rest of my talk will be about thorium and, and, and uranium radionuclides. Uh, this is a, a slide from UNSCEAR showing the variability of uranium in, in groundwater. Just as, uh, as a matter of, of, of record, uh, every, virtually every groundwater source a small municipality has in the Canadian Shield will have a radium problem, a radium scale problem. And there's no place in Canada to put the radium scales. It's a challenging uh, management situation. And of course, our good friend, our good friend radon. Everything around us is radioactive. So when we look at naturally occurring radioactive materials, it's no different. It's just sometimes we work with it differently or sometimes concentrate these materials. This is, is based on, on UNSCEAR. Uh, most recently, 2008, according to UNSCEAR, the average uh, dose to a person worldwide per capita dose is about 2.4 millisieverts per year. About half of that is, is from radon. The range, though, is quite variable. It's from 1 to 13 or so millisieverts a year, depending on where you live. That's important to know. These, this, this range of natural background doses encompasses all the doses we see from norm indices. Uh, I might add, uh, it's a point for discussion, I think, between Committee 2 and uh, UNSCEAR uh, with respect to the dose conversion factor that's used in this kind of, of calculation. This number relies on the unskier dose conversion factor, which has been in place for, I don't know, 16 years. Uh, and I think it's important for harmonization or consistency. So that is something that uh, I think would be worthwhile talking about uh, offline. Norm, I borrowed this without apologies from, from US EPA. Norm is simply naturally occurring radioactive material. And I don't distinguish between norm and T-norm. It's all norm. T-norm is just stuff you work with, humans intervene on, and it, it's a very U.S.-oriented uh, uh, terminology. I bor borrowed this from the Health Physics Society. Okay. I borrowed this slide from, from UNSCEAR uh, Annex B 2008, and it's a small list of the areas that are important to us, metal mining and, uh, and smelting. Uh, may not be, uh, be well known, but you don't have to be a uranium mine to have problems with radon and gamma radiation. Uh, I've actually uh, looked at radon in a diamond mine uh, as, a matter of, as a matter of interest. We have rare earth mines, we have uh, gold mines, and we've had uh, radon epidemiology from, from iron mines in Sweden and, and France and gold mines in, in South Africa. And, and actually in uh, uh, mines in Newfoundland, fluorospar mines. It's everywhere. Phosphate industry, I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, coal miners uh, in China and elsewhere are one of the world's largest sources of exposure from naturally occurring radioactive materials, in this case, radon. We also come back to oil and gas, uh, rare earths. Uh, titanium oxide, we all like white paint. Titanium oxide raw materials are all radioactive. You can't have white paint without radioactivity someplace in, in, in the circuit. There was one item came from Peter Shaw over in the corner that we're not going to talk about today other than the next 10 seconds, and that's simply transportation. IEA has a well-established regulatory system for, for exemptions and, and rules in transporting radioactive materials. However, we also have denial of shipments, not because there's harm, but because, oh my heavens, it's radioactive. Uh, we all have computers and cell phones. Almost all of the capacitors in our cell phones and computers are made with tantalum. All of the tantalum raw materials are radioactive, and there are denial of shipments problems. 
because one country has different rules than the other. The, the, the ICRP has an important role to play in this with respect to harmonization. And I think it's, it's an issue, I don't know whether, whether we've addressed not as ICRP, but it's possibly an area we can work with the IEA and, and help on the harmonization, it's very important. Uh, I mentioned uh, rare earths, application of, of, of uh, radium and thorium, historic contaminated sites in North America and in, in Europe. There's lots of sites where we used to make uh, glass mantles for Coleman lanterns. Uh, lots of money can be spent on, on cleaning up, uh, up these sites. There's lots of historic sites. Uh, and, and I see the scientific secretary chuckling in Canada. We have a famous uh, site at Port Radium and a transportation route that's subject for another talk at some point in the future. Uh, and other, we've also already mentioned uh, water treatment and the waste arising from, from water treatment. These are not trivial issues. You can get quite high concentrations, and at least in Canada, and I believe in, in the United States as well, uh, these wastes have sufficient radioactivity levels, primarily radium-226, that they're not accepted by conventional municipal landfills. What do you do with it? And mis municipalities cannot afford to go to, to uh, a radioactive uh, landfill. There are lots of practical problems. Okay. Key radionuclides are obviously radium and thorium series radionuclides. In particular, radium-226. Uh, we'll focus on that. That's in all the scales. And also radon-222. In the oil and gas industry, radon-222 is a hugely important isotope. It's mobile. It's a noble gas. And it will go a long way through the, through the system. And when it uh, decays, it can become uh, uh, lead-210 and polonium, which do build up in, in uh, gas plants and ethylene plants and other parts of our, of our uh, gas production system. This is a slide I borrowed uh, without apology from the IEA. Dennis Weimer put this slide together and it shows the uh, uranium thorium series uh, radionuclides and it shows the magical uh, one becquerel per gram uh, IEA uh, limit. Uh, bottom line, again, everything is radioactive. You have uranium ores uh, at the top, and I would argue uranium is a norm material. The only thing that distinguishes it is the fact it's regulated in most countries. And the difference between regulated and unregulated is it's really discretionary on the country of, of interest. Uranium mining is a norm activity. In Canada, it's regulated by the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. In the United States, uranium mining is not regulated by the US NRC, other than in situ recovery, which is considered milling, and, and Don can explain that, uh, which is regulated by the, by the NRC. The mill tailings from conventional mining, though, are regulated by the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission. No one ever said that regulations and regulatory actions are simple. These are the, uh, from, I borrowed these from, from Jamie, our organization, the World Nuclear Association. Uh, recent production from 2012, in situ recovery, uh, open cast, open pit mining, underground mining, uh, and byproducts. Well, yes, you can produce uranium from gold mining. You can produce uranium from, from uh, phosphate fertilizer production. By the way, everybody does understand, I hope, that the phosphate fertilizer that I put in my lawn and you put in your lawn contains uranium. Uh, is, is the phosphate rock typically contains in the order of a becquerel per gram of uranium series radionuclides. The uranium stays with the fertilizer. The radium and the other radionuclides end up in the byproduct, phosphogypsum. So we did some surveys over a nuclear power plant in, in uh, Canada a few years back. Uh, flyovers and the hottest thing we could find other than the dome of the nuclear reactors were fields uh, which were fertilized with, with uranium. But it's beneficial. There's a use for it. There's a purpose for it. It's easy to justify. Just as an aside, this, uh, I almost pulled this slide this morning at the last minute because it shows average values from a slide I had a few years ago. The average exposures in Canadian uranium mines, even the very high grade mines, are low. That doesn't mean the new mines are going to be as low because of different mining methods, and it also doesn't mean there's not a tail to the distribution that's going to be very challenging to look at with the new radon uh, rules. Phosphogypsum stacks. Phosphogypsum is an important, uh, pardon me, non-important product. It's a byproduct. 
but uh, phosphate mining and fertilizer production is very important in the Middle East, in Morocco, in Tunisia, in Jordan, uh, and also in the United States. Uh, Florida, for example, has over a million cubic meters of phosphate gypsum in stacks. I would argue it's a byproduct. It has uses. It's not just a waste. You have a choice. You can, you can manage it forever in stacks as a waste and spend lots of money on that, or you can be creative and find productive uses for it. Uh, there is a project that's in which the IEA uh, is involved, along with the Florida Institute of Phosphate Research and many countries, Brazil and Morocco amongst others, looking at ways you can constructively use the phosphate gypsum, which brings me to the next slide, I hope. I'm two slides on. Uh, is, is I reorganized the slides this morning, so it's a bit of an adventure tour for me as well. This is a, a, a photograph from, from uh, Alberta of uh, phosphate uh, fertilizer production uh, in the middle of, of Calgary, and it shows two stacks about 50 and 90 hectares in size. And I just want to show, this slide shows the radon concentrations from a network of radon monitors around the stack, uh, some basically immediately adjacent out to, out to background. A and basically there is no difference between background and the levels adjacent to the stack. So yes, there is radon from the fossil gypsum stacks. Absolutely, it's contributing, but not in material fashion, one could argue. I missed that. I missed that previous slide altogether on, on the useful byproducts. Uh, is radioactivity in rare earth processing? Uh, we work on a project in, in Northwest Territories where the thorium content of the rare earth mine is, is in excess of over one percent thorium. And in most universes, that would be classified as a as a thorium mine. However, in Canada. Since the mining is not being done for the purpose of recovering thorium or uranium, it's not regulated by the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. Uh, and, and it's not hard to conceive of potential for, not necessarily, but potential for high doses if you're not careful when you're dealing with materials containing 1% thorium. However, the mines that I'm familiar with and the process plants do imply modern radiation protection principles and the exposures are, are low. Uh, but you have to have these practices in, in place. I'm coming to the slide I talked about twice before. Here's a picture of, of fossil gypsum being used to build a road in, in uh, Florida. Uh, EPA uh, has a regulatory authority on this and very restrictive rules. In any event, you can do uh, risk assessments and dose assessments and demonstrate a number of uses of fossil gypsum as a byproduct for which the doses are low and meet EPA uh, risk criteria. Examples include uh, road building. It it's, has very good properties. It's cementitious properties. It can be used as an amendment in cement manufacture. Uh, the original use was in agriculture. All the phosphate uh, stacks in, in California are gone. They've been used in, in uh, fertilizer, uh, as fertilizer, and as a daily landfill cover. And I'm running out of time, so I'll, I'll answer questions about that later. But if you do add fossil gypsum as daily cover in a landfill, it accelerates the bi microbial decomposition in a landfill and can get you an extra 40% space in, in, uh, in a conventional landfill. Phosphate slag has been used in many places for, for road construction, and that's that's really an interesting debate we don't have time for now. Radionuclides and coal power plants. All coal has some radioactivity. When you burn it, you, you get the residual concentration factor by uh, increase the original concentration by a factor of 20 or so. Uh, here's some data on US uh, coals. Uh, basically, and I apologize for the American news, but you can see at the bottom, some of the concentrations in the coals themselves are 60 to 100 parts per million which is starting to be appreciable. Uh, you can also look at exposure pathways. The reality though, even though the concentrations in the coal and the coal ash can be high, the doses are low. Oil and gas, very important here. Uh, in the United States, 30% roughly of the oil and gas uh, wells are faced with technologically enhanced norm, and I thought I had purged the terminology, but I didn't. Uh, 20 to 100 percent of the facilities in different states report the presence of, of T-norm. 
and more than half of the gas producing and oil producing uh, equipment shows elevated levels of, of timon, in some cases quite elevated. This is a comic book I won't, uh, won't elaborate on. Uh, radium is typically soluble to some level in, in produced waters, plates out on, on equipment. Uh, but what people sometimes don't recognize is the radon gas can get much further down your distribution system and then converts to lead 210 and polonium at quite high concentrations in some cases. Hugely variable from, from, from field to field. <clears throat> this stuff plates out on, on surfaces of, of pipes and, and pumps and, and, and other vessels. Uh, and here are the major, major radionuclides. That's what uh, it looks like inside. It chews up the, up the volume in pipes and vessels. You get similar calcium uh, deposits in, in uh, uh, water treatment systems. This is a, is a comic book. Uh, as long as the radioactivity is inside pipes and vessels, it's really a potential gamma exposure situation. Uh, when, uh, when a worker opens vessels to do maintenance or change a pump or replace a, replace a pipe, there is potential not only for external gamma, but also for inhalation exposure. And again, I apologize for the, for the, for the American units. Uh, these are concentrations from 1973. EPA was ahead of the game there, Mike, looking at radon in, uh, in natural gas distribution lines in the order of one to two becquerels uh, per liter. Uh, last few slides I'm going to focus on, on uh, shale gas. Uh, fracking is a big issue, huge issue in North America and, uh, and Europe. This shows the uh, shale plays in the lower uh, 48 states. Lots of controversy about uh, inducing earthquakes, about the amount of water they use. Uh, but the gas produced this way is, is also uh, radioactive. Uh, in, in Canada, we recently had near riots in New Brunswick, uh, leading to temporary suspension of, of people intending to uh, do uh, fracking development in, in New Brunswick. It's controversial, I believe, in the UK as well, and certainly in, in, in the United States. We've already dealt with at least one injunction against using fracking gas uh, from uh, upper uh, New York State and Pennsylvania in New York City, because the concern was everyone in New York was going to die from, from exposure to, to radon gas. Now, it turned out that gas had two becquerels per cubic meter of, of radon in it, but as it goes through the system uh, and has delay time and things, uh, it decreases. Uh, but you can actually do the detailed calculations and demonstrate quite clearly that not everybody in New York is going to die from radon-induced lung cancer. However, it is an issue. Uh, EPA, I think I have a slide coming up. Okay, here's some data on, on Marcellus shale. Uh, the gamma fields from the sludge are anywhere from six to 250 microrecans per hour. You can do the conversion. Uh, you know, uh, uh, 100 uh, becquerels per gram of, uh, of uh, radium. And uh, natural gas, similar to the other slide I showed you, contains one to two uh, becquerels per, per liter of radon uh, in the natural gas. EPA, uh, science advisory, EPA uh, provided a science advisory board with a report on uh, fracking. Uh, and there's a number of issues that EPA Science Advisory Board is, is looking at, including potential for uh, uh, how much water the fracking uses, the, the induction of, of earthquakes. Uh, it also leads to quite high concentrations of, of radium and other radionuclides being mobilized in, in the returned water, and hence leading to a, a waste management issue uh, as well. Uh, this study should be available uh, by the end of, of 2014. And, and it's quite interesting because there are hopes, at least in the United States, for significant uh, gas supply through, uh, through fracking. Uh, very quick comments, International System of Radiation Protection. Uh, ICRP, this document uh, is, is very near and dear to several people in, in, in the room. Be lots of discussion of that. IEA plays an important role, and they produce lots of very useful documents, and very recently useful documents on, on all sorts of, of norm materials. 
In Canada, uh, NORM is not regulated directly, but we do have guidelines provided, in this case, by Health Canada, our health authority. And the provinces uh, and territories typically adopt these guidelines, and if they have questions, they send technical reports to the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission for technical review. In the United States, uh, uh, it's already been indicated that NRC does not have regulatory authority. This resides with the states. EPA does have some authority uh, with respect to, didn't change on me, uh, with respect to uh, uh, circular type uh, waste from, from uh, arising from historic use. In the majority of, of norm situations, you can have quite high concentrations but the high concentrations don't necessarily lead to high dose, and that has been mentioned, mentioned previously. So just because a certain activity has a high radium or high lead 210 doesn't necessarily mean it's going to lead to an exposure circumstance where a worker, a member of the public, has a high, high dose. You do have opportunities in, in processing, uh, however, to have enhanced uh, levels, uh, and people should be aware and take appropriate radiation protection uh, measures. I think this is my final slide. Radioactivity and norm production is an important issue for the public and for, for regulators and for operators. We need to have, uh, have a common way of looking at it. Uh, doses to workers uh, from the analysis we've done and are published are potentially high, but in actual fact, they seem to be well managed, which is encouraging. Uh, proven established radiation protection practices are available and widely employed to, to uh, manage uh, potential exposures. And uh, I didn't have time to go into it, but it was a theme this morning. It's certainly a theme with norm activities. It's very important to deal with the multiple stakeholders that you run into on, on new and proposed projects and deal openly and honestly with them. And that's my last slide. Thank you very much. <laughs>